Hi, this is Dave Worden. Let's talk a bit about sight reading. People often ask me, how can I improve my sight reading? Well, sight reading is reading in some sense, just like you'd read a book. Uh, if you're not familiar with a book and have to read it aloud, you might stumble over it. Now, here I have a book I'm familiar with. In the musical sense, this is the Arben um, book, which is edited by Joe Alisi and Brian Bowman. And this is Dr. Bowman's biography page. Because I'm familiar with Brian Bowman, because I'm familiar with the euphonium, I can read this page more easily than some people might. Dr. Brian Bowman is one of the foremost euphonium soloists in the world today. His history of euphonium firsts is impressive. And then it goes on from there. Now, if you didn't know what a euphonium was, you'd probably stumble over that. It's spelled kind of funny, starting with E-U-P. Um, but if you're familiar with other words, euphonic, um, for example, which means pleasant sounding, then you might be able to read that more easily. So with re reading words, we first learn words like cat and dog, which are very simple. Then we learn to put them together with other words, the cat, the dog. Music works the same way. Probably anybody watching this tape knows all the notes that they have to deal with. But how do we put them together when we're sight reading, when we don't know the piece we're playing? Like anything else, you need to be familiar with note patterns. So during your warm-up, you should be working on scales. Obviously, that's a standard thing for warm-ups. But don't play the same scales every day, and I suggest not reading them out of a book. Once you know what the scale is, try to play it out of your mind and put it in different octaves or extend the scale a little bit. So take a B-flat scale or a C scale in treble clef. The basic scale is this. So that B-flat scale I just played, let's extend it by one note on the top. Now that does a couple of things. First of all, it changes the finger pattern slightly. It also changes the rhythmic pattern on the way down. So you're starting now on the ninth of the scale, or the second of the scale of an octave. But if you play it the way I played it the first time, then the first note of that sequence down is the note of the scale, C or B flat. That difference, that slight difference, gets you used to a, that B flat or a C scale with a different pattern. So that note is now your third note, where the third note in the other pattern It's a small difference, but it actually does help you learn what patterns look like. You should be thinking about those patterns, thinking about the rhythm. I think in 16th notes usually. So dee da 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 dee da 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 is what my brain is doing. Let's go one note further. So now I went up to a D concert, or E in treble clef, and that again changes the pattern. So I'll play with patterns like that during my warm-up. It helps keep my brain fresh. I'll stay with that B-flat or C scale for now. Or I can get a little fancier and connect them. Don't stop between. Needed to take a breath there. I'll stop and continue on from the same point in the pattern. We could also do the same thing in both directions. I like this as a mental exercise. So I'll start with the same one octave scale, play it once. As I come down, I'll go down a step lower on the bottom. Going back up, I'll go a step higher. Come down, go a third lower, back up, a third higher. Ran out of air there. 
But that's how I work. So that way I've got my brain engaged and I'm playing different patterns, assembling the scale in different ways. And I'm still only slurring, I'm still only playing straight eighth notes or sixteenth notes, depending on how you think of it, in the easiest scale we probably have. So if you move that up a half step, all of a sudden the brain has to work a lot harder. You should get to know all of your scales in ways like that where you're challenging yourself different days with different patterns. There's a multitude of patterns you can come up with. Uh, make up your own, look in the Arben book or some of the other method books and you'll probably see some patterns in there. This is kind of a common pattern. I'll add some tonguing in here as well. Something like that, then move that around in different keys. Let's try now some arpeggios on that same tonic note. And using the same principle as the scales, I'll go up a note and then up another note. Now I'm going to vary that a little bit more, as I did with that scale example. I'll start with my octave, then I'll, when I'm going up this time, I'll go the extra note. Coming down, then I'll go a matching one extra note. Going up, I'll go two extra notes. Coming down, two extra notes. Stop wherever you like. So again, that's a way you're helping your train your brain and your body to pace themselves together. Now those are things you can do to get yourself warmed up well, to get some free practice time, but it's also teaching you how to sight read because you're learning to integrate these patterns up here instead of just in here. When you're sight reading, you don't have a memorized picture of the page. So what you're seeing here is brand new. And if you know these patterns already, you've got a big head start. I'm gonna play an example now. For this example, I'm going to start with a Sousa march that I've never played before. It's called Congress Hall, written in 1882, one of his early marches. This is in 6-8, obviously at a march tempo. right there. I think that's the first actual mistake I've made so far. Uh, I fluffed a note, but that can happen anyway. A lot of what you just heard are figures within the scales I was practicing. Those patterns are three notes of the scale. When I get into the first strain, there's a three-note fragment, but then the next six, seven notes are all contiguous, just notes of the scale. And then back to the introduction, the fourth measure is an arpeggio. In this case, it's a dominant seventh, we would call it, where you've got the one, three, five, seven notes. There are pages of exercises for those notes or that pattern in the Arben book. Uh, you learn a lot from the Arben book. In fact, if you knew the entire Arben book inside and out, you'd be a really great sight reader by now. In the first strain, Next we have that B-flat arpeggio I just worked on as part of the warm-up. And then back to scales with a small chromatic thrown in. As I mentioned, that's probably our easiest key, B-flat concert or C in treble clef. If a sight reading piece were in the key of concert E, which would be F-sharp, or treble clef, that's getting into quite a few sharps either way and be a little harder to sight read, but not nearly as hard if you've been working on E scales or F sharp scales during your warm up, trying different patterns with them, being familiar with different ways to lay out the scale, starting at different points in the scale, and so on. So, sight reading is really just pulling together many things that you've already learned.
I have another Sousa March here. Again, it's one I haven't played. It's called Across the Danube. This one starts in two flats in treble clef. At the trio, it goes to three flats. Across the Danube is also a 6-8 mark, just as the previous one was. This one starts with grace notes. Now, before you start playing the piece you're sight reading, usually you have time to look it over, even briefly. In a community band rehearsal, you certainly would. In a sight reading audition, you can take a few seconds to look before you start to play. You shouldn't take too long, but a few seconds is fine. That would tell me I need to be ready for the grace notes at the very beginning of the piece. They don't show up again. Uh, nothing in the rest of the piece looks terribly challenging. I stopped briefly here because I ran into a trap that you might encounter, partly because I do know patterns. Um, the march was fairly standard, as I explained. It started fortissimo. The first strain went down to piano. I picked that up as I was reading. Then in the fourth measure, I thought I was going to play a simple arpeggio. But that last note skips one of the notes in an arpeggio. I wasn't ready for that. So that's a case where it caught me and it didn't sound very good right there. Now that's a point about sight reading. If I were doing this for real, I wouldn't have stopped. And you should not either. You should also not change tempo. Uh, if you're having to think about a note, just don't stop to think about it. Just play through and charge ahead with your best guess if you have to. But keep playing. Keep the tempo going. That's usually what an audition panel wants to hear. They want to hear that you can keep going under duress. And if you're playing in a rehearsal, obviously you want to keep going. You don't want to stop to think about the next note because perhaps most of the rest of the band didn't stop to think about that. I'll start this one over. Stopping there again because we had an arpeggio, but it was one of those dominant seventh shape arpeggios, one, three, five, seven. Instead of, again, in the Arban book, there are plenty of examples to practice. When I go on to the second strain now with the pickup, I'll just keep going for a while. Uh, if I make a mistake, you'll hear the mistake, and I'm not going to stop for it. I will try not to change tempo in spite of any stumble that might happen. Okay, so that was my best effort. However, there was one tricky part that I missed, and I happened to sight read it okay as we got to it. We're leading into a measure with six eighth notes. Like that. On the downbeat, we have two sixteenths followed by a quarter. Da -di -ya, da -di -ya. And then, that's where am I? There I go. That happens four times. And then the next one has two grace notes before the first note, so they come ahead of the beat. So we've got da-di-ya, 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 
Dadia Daya. A little bit tricky. I haven't actually seen that in the Sousa march that I recall. That little moment in the march I just read brings up a good point. I like to use the Arben book, as I've mentioned several times in videos. I use the, well, this says Complete Method. The other title I've seen is the Complete Conservatory Edition. Because in the middle of that, it has the art of phrasing. And the pages there are loaded with short, simple songs. The first song in the book you may not know is called Robin Adair. I had planned on showing this as part of the, the warm-up and mental training process. This march proved to be a, a good example of why this particular piece might be good to use. What I was going to suggest is, in this book there are over a hundred of these little short songs. Read one every day. But the first time through each of these, make sure you are sight reading. Take a minute to look at it, decide about tempo, notice the key, things like that, and then start and just keep going. Also try to sell the style of the piece you're playing. As I did when I read the marches earlier, I tried to play them in a good march style, I tried to make my phrases lead somewhere, I tried to observe dynamics. Same thing with these. Robin Adair is marked Andante Dolce, so it's slow and pretty. The reason I thought of it as I was playing that last march is this has another one of those unusual rhythms where the short note rhythmically is on the downbeat. So we're used to playing dotted eighths and sixteenths, dum, da dum, da dum, but this has da da, da da, da da, where the sixteenth is followed by the dotted eighth. And yet it's in a pretty melody. So you can't make it sound that wouldn't do at all. It'd make it easier to play because some of them slur over lip slurs where you don't change fingerings. But that's not the style we want. looks pretty easy when you glance at it. It's actually a little hard to play because it is delicate and you need to make it sound that way. As I'm talking along now, I'm assuming that this is the point in your practice where you're warmed up. So now you're practicing exercises that will help you uh, with things you need to do. This particular one is number 69 in that same Arben book I was talking about. It's called Articulated Arpeggios. And it goes through the one chord and the five seven chords. So in this case, it's a B flat that starts the page out, B flat concert or C in treble clef. So you've got the standard B flat triad, B flat D, F or C, E, G in treble. Then the second half of each line goes to the 5-7 chord, so that's the dominant 7th chord, the chord that wants to normally lead you back to where you started on the 1 chord. That's an F7 chord, or F, A, C, E flat, or in treble clef, G, B, D, and F. It does that, but then in the final measure on that line, it uses that same shape, that dominant 7th shape, spelling out the new key that starts the next line. So each line has a new key in it. And the last measure on the previous line sets up that new key by playing that 5-7 chord, which makes you want to hear that next key. So it's a good way to get your mind used to those transitions. And also just by rote, learn these one chords and five chords and a whole slew of keys here on this page. In the case of this exercise, it takes you through 12 keys and then right back to where you started on the 13th line. So it's a good way to get used to progressions, to learning where key changes are coming, how they might be set up as you play the notes. And also sometimes those key changes happen without the signature changing. So the composer might write 
for maybe two bars in the middle of a section, he might write in a different key. And there could be a lot of accidentals in that part. That's because the key is changing from the signature. So that won't worry you much because you'll know all these patterns. You'll be used to them. So here's how the exercise goes. Again, it's good practice, good practice for accuracy. That's what I was trying to focus on there, and I need to improve that some. For the purpose of the recording we're making here, I'm talking about learning how to sight read, and these kind of patterns are what will help you learn how to sight read. Now I'm going to move toward the beginning of the book a little bit further. Um, there's an exercise number 47 called intervals. It's a fairly simple exercise. You've got intervals to play. You start by going up a fifth and then coming down, uh, but then there are scales. So you've got a measure of intervals, then a measure that is scale, measure of intervals, and a measure that is scale. continues. Now when I'm doing this kind of exercise for whatever reason, for helping me get better at sight reading, learning patterns, or for helping me get more accurate, you notice the breath I took in the middle was not in time at all. What I try to do in this case is to finish out the pattern, so that's usually going to the downbeat of the next measure, stopping, taking a breath, and playing that downbeat again as I go on to the next pattern. The concepts we've discussed today are two-part. There was a bit about warm-up, but that was really a secondary concept. What I was talking about there in the warm-up was mostly how to benefit from your warm-up time by getting some practice built in there, some learning of patterns and so on. Then the rest of the time we were talking about learning those specific patterns. When you're sight reading music, you need to be able to keep going, as I said, plow ahead. The more of those patterns you know, the more measures will sound really quite good and the better chance you'll have of guessing what some uncomfortable looking measure is, is going to be when you get there. Above all, be sure you incorporate sight reading practice into your daily practice. It doesn't have to be long. It can be those short little song examples in the Arben book or other more advanced things that you have. But try to get some sight reading in. If you go on the internet, there's a banned public domain music library out there where you can download a ton of music. The specific euphonium parts if you want to, or trombone parts or cornet parts. Good sight reading practice and they're free. So make use of your time. Um, Practice all the things you need to practice, but try to slide in there some sight reading practice. And as you're practicing all the other stuff, try to notice the patterns that are there. So you're not just playing the notes by rote, you're incorporating a concept, a learning up here of how those notes are built, how they're put together. See how that works out for you. I think it'll help. To finish off our conversation here about sight reading, I'm gonna sight read the second part of the Congress Hall March by Sousa. I only played the first part earlier. So now I'll play the trio, I'm going to sight read it, as I mentioned, and I won't stop, I'll just keep playing. So it looks very simple. Let's see if I'm right. <laughs>
tried to play it as though I knew what I was doing, even though I didn't. And as you might have heard, there were a couple things that were a little bit harder than I picked up by just glancing at it. But those are the breaks. So the more you practice the basics, the better chance you'll have to make your way through something like this and not slow down. Thanks for listening.